We're now two and a half weeks into Lent. So this is a good time for a little reminder of what we're doing here and why. Lent is a yearly opportunity for us to remind ourselves of who we are, what we believe, and to renew the graces that we received at our baptism. For this is where it all begins. Our baptism is an encounter with God in the person of Jesus. And he began his earthly ministry with these words. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now you might recognize that last sentence as one of the things that you might hear when the ministry, minister puts ashes on your forehead uh, at, on Ash Wednesday. During Lent, we especially think about repentance. And we usually think of regrets for things we may have said or done that did not follow the pattern of Jesus' teaching. The Greek word for repentance, metanoia, simply means a change of mind. It's not necessarily religious. It often can, it could express regret for past actions, perhaps a bad business deal or a purchase of something that wasn't worth what you paid for it, and you felt regret. But it is often expressed and used in scripture as regret for past actions. Here's something else though. Included in this idea of a change of mind is a new way of seeing things, including changed behavior that comes with that changed perspective. So to review a little bit about the process of, of repentance and conversion, it will be helpful for us to remind ourselves of what kind of creatures we are. We are unique in that we have a, a physical body, but we have a spirit soul. At baptism, our souls are cleansed from original sin. That is, they are prepared by God in a special way so that we are capable of responding to him in loving obedience. We call that being cleansed from original sin. But that is not the end of the salvation story. In fact, it's just the beginning. Why? Because salvation requires our cooperation. St. Augustine said, God who created you without you will not save you without you. So our post-baptismal life begins a journey of cooperation between us and God. God takes the first step. He begins by giving us the capacity to perceive, believe, and understand things that we cannot verify with our senses. This is called faith. And as we come to believe what God says, and if, as we respond through acts of obedience, he gives us more faith, as well as grace. That is, he gives us, he shares with us his supernatural life to empower us to do the things he has commanded to us. This process continues, especially as, as we go through various trials. Each of the trials we must face are allowed by God to refine us, to strengthen our faith, to conform us more fully to the image of Christ. And in the process, we come to know and trust God. Our souls play a key role in this process for they are the image of God in us. Now the soul is designed to be master over the body, but in our fallen state, our bodies, especially our appetites and our passions, often take the lead. Our Lenten disciplines, then, are a way for us to struggle against the situation by consciously deciding to do things that are contrary to our attraction in our flesh, to things that we perceive to be good, but which may be actually leading us away from God. We might think of our souls prior to our death as being like moist clay. While it is still moist, it is malleable. It can easily form it or deform it. But once it's been fired in a furnace, it hardens and never be changed. And this is exactly, in effect, what happens at the hour of our death. 
when we face the particular judgment. At that time, we will have to make a choice about what we truly love, what we consider to be the good that we want above all others. Since we are made for God, the highest good we can possibly want is him. However, we can also choose other things instead of God. But whatever choice we make at that time, our souls will be permanently fixed on that choice forever. That's why it's so important that the habits that we've formed by the daily choices that we have made during our entire lifetime will determine what we choose when we die. If we choose anything other than God, we will be choosing separation from God. And that's what we call hell. This is why repentance is so important. Not just be sorry for something that we've done, but changing our mind, seeing things in a new way. We are urged to replace bad habits, what we, what we call vices, with good habits, which we call virtues. We're called upon to learn to love what is good and to hate what is evil. For again, at the judgment, the moral state of our soul will drive our final decision. The Catechism says, interior repentance is a radical reorientation of our whole life, a return, a conversion to God with all our heart, an end of sin, a turning away from evil, with repugnance toward the evil actions we have committed. At the same time, it entails the desire and resolution to change one's life with hope in God's mercy and trust in the help of his grace. In Jesus' parable of the fig tree, the problem is lack of fruit. Now in scripture, God's people are often compared to fruit-bearing plants. Psalm 1 calls the righteous person a tree planted by a river with its well watered. The prophet Isaiah compares Israel to a vineyard that produced sour wild grapes instead of tasty grapes that could be turned into fine wine. Jesus himself compared himself to a vine and to his disciples into or to branches on that vine. But he also says his father takes away every branch in him that does not bear fruit. Fruit bearing is what healthy plants do, and that is what God expects from us, for he has provided all that we need abundantly to do that. It is true that newly planted trees may take a season or two to be productive, just like us. As we come to know God, it may take us a while to get rid of old habits and replace them with new habits. But if a tree does not produce fruit, it's likely to be cut down and replaced with a different tree that does bear fruit. Jesus is warning us here that we don't have unlimited time to do this. Sometimes we may lose sight of the grand vision that God has for his human children. And this may particularly happen either, ironically, when things are going very well or when things are going very badly. When things are bad, we may tend to blame God for allowing those bad things to interrupt our peace and security. On the other hand, when things are going well, we may forget that all good gifts ultimately come from God and think that we're primarily responsible for our own success or our prosperity. Either way, anything that distracts us from God, we need to see things differently. We need repentance. We need conversion. Christ calls us to see everything in relation to God. So turning away from sin should all, always mean turning toward God. But we, again, we do not have unlimited time in which to cultivate our relationship with God. It takes time to develop habits, and that's what we need to do to lead us to a favorable judgment. And that's the point of Christ's response to the stories of the Galileans and the people of Siloam. We always need to be aware of the uncertainty of our lifetime. Now, in this story, we don't have any details about the death of the Galileans. Uh, Luke is the only gospel writer that says anything about this, but these Galilean Jews went down to Jerusalem to sacrifice to God. 
They were no doubt happy, looking forward to it. Somehow they ran afoul of the Roman authorities under Pilate and were killed. The same thing happened to those people who were under the tower of Siloam when it, when it collapsed. The common theme is that those deaths were unexpected. Jesus' message is likewise clear. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. It's not a really big and exciting message for people to hear, but it is, it's true and it's important that we take it to heart. Jesus loves us. He died for us. He wants us to come to know him. He wants us to learn his ways, to become convinced of their excellence, to be moved to love and imitate him. And to that end, God made sure that an accurate record was kept of what Jesus said and did. He built a church as a container to and protector and interpreter of his self-revelation to us. He sent prophets and saints to show us what righteous living looks like. He gathers us regularly as a family, like we are here, to feed us with his own body and blood. He sends his Holy Spirit to guide and teach us. The church provides so many resources that we can use to strengthen our depth of knowledge of the faith. And we have many opportunities to do the works that Jesus prescribed that reflect a change of mind and heart, repentance, conversion. During Lent, we focus particularly on prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. They're proven ways to counter the sinful tendencies that we have. But we must avail ourselves of these disciplines before they can change us. The purpose of this life is for us to be tested, that we may show by our words and deeds where we want to spend eternity. So, if you are aware of something that needs to change in your thinking or actions, I certainly have one, more than one, do it now. This is immensely important since there's no guarantee as to how long any of us will live. Time and unforeseen occurrence befall us all. Any day could be our last. What should we do then? Repent, turn away from sin and turn toward God. This is why we pray. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death.